we move on to our next talk which is thyroid disorders a practical approach by dr g uh, shanmugasundar a small introduction about dr shanmugasundar he is the managing director of magna core center for obesity diabetes and endocrinology he was trained from pgi chandigarh has published about 20 articles in various medical journals and has also contributed chapters in textbooks in the field of diabetes and endocrinology he is a part time super specialist in esi medical college kk nagar he was a best outgoing student in mbbs he was a topper in various subjects during mbbs and was also the university topper in anatomy he is he was a recipient of ab gandhi award for excellence in endocrinology the best clinical acumen in spot case diagnosis in 2010 over to you sir my slides are visible yes sir can yes, you please visible. go on yes, please yeah yes sir yes. Yeah. yeah thanks dr priya for a kind introduction and uh, thanks to ima kodambakam for giving me this opportunity so what i'm going to discuss is a very simple talk so more practical points i'm going to discuss and uh, so basically thyroid is a very very common problem so i'm what i'm going to discuss is very briefly about the hypothalamus pituitary thyroid axis in a single slide and uh, what are the thyroid function tests or what are the extra tests we will require to diagnose and uh, to establish the cause of thyroid disorders and how to screen evaluate and manage the sus patient with suspected thyroid dysfunction and finally few slides on the patients with thyroid nodular disorders we all know that in any endocrine organ there will be a negative feedback mechanism similarly thyroid has also uh, same so it's a very tightly regulated mechanism so the thyroid gland produces t4 and t3 so t3 is the active hormone so only 10% of the t3 is produced from the thyroid gland and rest 90% is converted from t4 by dihydrogenase so this t3 acts on the target organs various target organs heart nerves bone muscles etc so the t4 and t3 negatively influences the trh and tsh so basically if t3 t4 are high the trh and tsh is inhibited and if t4 t3 levels are low like in hypothyroidism trh and tsh will be elevated this is basically about the hypothalamus pituitary thyroid axis so what are the main thyroid function tests we need any 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 condition any chronic condition two types are there one is to diagnose the condition so to diagnose the condition we need to do the blood investigation like thyroid function test and once the diagnosis is confirmed then we need to establish the cause so we need to do some more investigation to see what is the cause for the thyroid dysfunction so diagnose thyroid dysfunction mainly the tsh is the primary investigation most of the times we may, we can make diagnosis with the help of tsh itself so if tsh is normal most of the time the patient is youth thyroid except the patient has secondary hypothyroidism that is the problem is at the level of hypothalamus or pituitary usually they are youth thyroid and if tsh is high as i told in the previous slide due to negative feedback mechanism in hypothyroidism tsh will be elevated if tsh is high we have to suspect hypothyroid and if t4 is normal then it is called as subclinical hypothyroid and t4 is also low then it is called as overt hypothyroid similarly if tsh is undetectable or subnormal then it is a hyperthyroid and again if t3 t4 are normal it is called as subclinical hyperthyroid and if it is elevated then it is called as overt hyperthyroidism and sometimes yeah, it's very important t4 can be normal in uh, grave disease because sometimes only t3 will be elevated so we have to suspect t3 toxicosis in those situation but always there will be some exception similarly when uh, we are using only tsh as a screening test sometimes we may miss miss some diagnosis like in hypopituitarism so hypopituitarism primarily the tsh is less even in sometimes you will see the slight elevation in tsh but t4 will be very much uh, reduced so in those kind of situation you have to suspect hypopituitarism because most of the time the tsh whatever you are seeing is a biologically inactive hormone sometimes for example if tsh t3 t4 is very much uh, low but tsh is 6 or 7 that patient may not be having the say of primary hypothyroidism probably he may be having the uh, hypopituitarism the problem must be at the level of uh, pituitary or hypothalamus so we have to see those things also so the, those tsh are biologically inactive so always rule out uh, secondary hypothyroidism and in any patient post radioiodine treatment or during therapy with anti thyroid drugs again tsh is not an ideal uh, measure to monitor Uh, so usually t4 is indicated because many times you will see post iodine treatment or during anti thyroid drugs 
the TSH will be suppressed and T4 also will be suppressed. So in those conditions, the treatment will be based on the T4 levels, not the based on the TSH level. So you have to get both T4 and TSH during that time. And secondary hyperthyroidism, very, very rare. TSH secreting pituitary adenoma uh, may be missed if you are only doing TSH. So in those cases also, again, T4, TSH is essential. And unreliable and acutely ill patients, we all know that uh, non-thyroid illness or uh, sick thyroid syndrome. So in those conditions also, TSH is unreliable unless the TSH is more than 20. If more than 20, then we can start the patient on treatment. And in acutely ill, Ill patient, the TSH go, go high up to 20 also. So in those patients, we have to see the clinical scenario and take call. And again, very important for people who are managing uh, ICU. If the patient is on dopamine or steroid therapy, again, that can suppress the TSH level. So falsely, the TSH can be low if the patient is receiving dopamine infusion or steroid therapy. Again, for gastroenterologists, if the patient has been prescribed on uh, octreotide, uh, again, it can lead to decrease in the TSH level. So these are the drugs which can uh, decrease the TSH level. So in those conditions, TSH is not a reliable indicator. What are the additional tests will be required? Establish the cause of thyroid dysfunction. So most of the time, these this are the tests which will be useful. So thyroid ultrasound, thyroid scintigraphy, either it's an iodine uptake scan or the thyroid technetium scan. So usually for the benign condition, we use thyroid technetium scan. Only in malignancy, we go for iodine uptake scan. And thyroid antibodies, antibody and thyroglobulin antibody in hypothyroidism to establish the autoimmunity we do. And TSH receptor antibody, usually we do it in hyperthyroidism. It's a very valuable testing to establish the cause of uh, hyperthyroidism, particularly in patients with pregnancy and postpartum. Because in those conditions, we can't do te technician sc scan. Because it's a nuclear scan, baby can get affected. So in those conditions, TSH receptor antibodies and very valuable test to say whether the patient is having Graves disease or thyroiditis or other form of hyperthyroidism. Thyroglobulin, again, we do it only for in patients with thyroid car carcinoma, not in other disease. In thyroid carcinoma, particularly to follow up the patient, whether the treatment is complete, whether the patient requires repeat radioidine ablation, we do thyroglobulin. Otherwise, in routine uh, cases, we don't do thy thyroglobulin. And if we suspect secondary hypothyroidism, that is a problem at hypothalamus or pituitary level, then we have to rule out two other pituitary function tests like <laughs> sex hormones and cortisol and if required MRI imaging. So these are the usually additional imaging we will require while evaluating the patient with thyroid dysfunction. So coming to the hypothyroidism, uh, this is a very common disease, probably after diabetes, this is one of the most common endocrine disorder, and it can affect any time during the life, even during intrauterine period. So congenital hypothyroidism is again a completely different topic. And it, during pregnancy, it's very, again, important topic. So starting from child, intrauterine to elderly population, the people can get hypothyroidism. So most common cause is primary hypothyroidism. Secondary hypothyroidism is very, very rare. And But most important thing is it's very easy to diagnose and very easy to treat. And the patient will also be very satisfied with the treatment. So the common cause is autoimmune. That is due to the uh, presence of anti-TP or anti-thyroglobulin antibody in most of the disease, most of the cases. And other causes are post-radiodine therapy or post-surgery or post-radiation therapy to the head and neck. And rarely some drugs like amiodrone or lithium again can cause hypothyroidism. And secondary hypothyroidism is due to pituitary hypothalamic lesion. Coming to the practical point. So when should we do thyroid function test in our clinical practice? If the patient has typical symptoms like fatigue, food intolerance, constipation, flowing, depression, etc., obviously we will get a thyroid function test. But there are certain situations where you have to do thyroid function tests, even the patient doesn't have a typical symptoms like nerve entrapment syndromes, menstrual disturbances, patients coming for infertility, or recurrent uh, abortions, bad obstetric history, and unexplained bradycardia and galactoria. Again, very important in any patient with galactoria, check for whether the patient is taking any domperidone, lesurate kind of drugs, or the patient has hypothyroidism. So these are the clinical situations where we have to rule out hypothyroidism. And laboratory test abnormalities, because nowadays we are seeing many patients coming with mass cell checkup. So in young patient without any other uh, uh, family history, if the case having a severe hypercholesterolemia and unexplained hyponatremia, always rule out hypothyroidism and hypocortisolism before going for any treatment. Because these are easily correctable causes for hyponatremia, always do thyroid function test and cortisol. Any case of hyperplactinemia, again, rule out hypothyroidism. If you correct hypothyroidism, automatically the prolactin level will come down. Hyperhomocysteinemia, refractory anemia, and creatine phosphokinase kinase elevation without any, a, a, any other cause. If it is there, we have to rule out hypothyroidism. 
any other uh, risk for autoimmune disease or family history of autoimmune disease, obviously we need to rule out uh, hypothyroidism. For example, a patient with type 1 diabetes, celiac disease, we have to do uh, thyroid function test periodically. Previous history of thyroid injury, again, we have previous history of thyroid injury, we have to rule out hypothyroidism. And in patients taking drugs like lithium or amiodron, also do periodical thyroid functioning test. And also I already mentioned any hypothalamic or pituitary disorders, always we have to monitor thyroid function. And in this case, T4 level we have to monitor, not TSH. Again, very important point. Because most of the times what we see is the patient comes to TSH and the, usually the treating physician or surgeon used to reduce the dose based on the TSH level. Because in this hypothalamic pituitary disorders, obviously TSH will be low. So don't decide the dose based on the TSH level. The dose will be decided based on the T4, T4 level. Coming to the practical point, uh, how to start the treatment. So I'm going to discuss uh, my talk, full talk uh, completely on non-pregnant patients, only not the thyroid disorders in pregnant patients because that's a completely different talk. So in non-pregnant patients, uh, if, you know, if it's over hypothyroidism, start with 1.6 microgram per kilogram per day. It is the initial dose. So usually the treatment dose is based on the weight. Okay, so don't start blindly like 75, 100 microgram like that. So start with 1.6 microgram per kilogram per body weight. Except in older patients and in patients with known or suspected cardiac disease, start with lower dose, that is 25 or 50 microgram. And check TSH every four weekly till full replacement dose is reached. So very important point again. So in patients with uh, unstable angina, are uh, already uh, having cardiac failure, don't start full dose, start slowly and gradually increase because thyroxine itself can precipitate angina. So pregnant patients, if immediately uh, after confirming pregnancy, you can increase the dose by 25 to 30 percentage. Coming with patients with subclinical hypothyroidism, if TSH is more than 10, you can start with 1.6 microgram per kilogram per day. And if TSH is less than 10, you can start either by 25 to 50 microgram based on the weight and increase the dose gradually till the TSH target is reached. It's very easy to treat hypothyroidism in most of the cases, except for a few uh, conditions. That is called as refractory hypothyroidism. I will just spend my uh, few minutes on this because it's very important. So what is refractory hypothyroidism? Even if after giving the dose of 1.9 to 2 microgram per kilogram body weight, if still TSH is not under control, then we called it as refractory hypothyroidism. Either TSH is not under control or thyroid symptoms, hypothyroid symptoms are not resolved, then we called it as refractory hypothyroidism. So again, you see, it is based on the weight. For example, if the patient is uh, uh, 130 uh, kilogram and his dose is only 50 uh, microgram, he will not be uh, labeled as refractory hypothyroidism because he is receiving only 1.2 microgram per kilogram body weight. If suppose, for, for example, patient is 50, 50 kg, but the patient is requiring 125 microgram of uh, ultra thyroxine, then he will, uh, the patient will be referred as refractory hypothyroidism because the patient is requiring more than 2 microgram per kilogram body weight. So it's basically based on the body weight of the patients. So further increase in the thyroxine dose always will, will lead, sometimes can lead to supra-therapeutic dose and can associate it with cardiovascular or other effects like osteoporosis. So we need to rule out certain things. In very important slide. So always check for the compliance. Complaints is both things, one is whether the patient is missing in the tablets, either most of the patient may be missing one or two days of uh, tablets per week. We all know that thyroxine therapy has a long half-life, almost for seven days. So if patient is regularly missing one or two days of tablets, the steady state may not achieve. So the TSH may be persistently elevated. Second is if the patient is not giving gap after taking the tablet. The patient is taking the uh, beverages or food within 30 minutes, one hour of after taking the tablet. Again, it is called as uh, non compliant So always review the thyroxine ingestion history, whether the patient is taking regularly or the patient is uh, patient is uh, giving the gap after taking the tablet. Second is check the patient's medication bottles and tablets. Again, it's very important. Ask the patient where they are keeping the tablets. Many times the patient may be keeping their tablets in the kitchen or at the top of the fridge or exposed to the sunlight, etc. And many times the patient will take multiple tablets in the hand, the bedtime. Immediately after brushing, they will take the tablets, multiple tablets in the hand, and they will put the few tablets again into the body bottle. So again, the moisture will uh, reduce the potency. And uh, these are the things very important we need to ask. And also, many patients will remove the sandbag from the 
bottle. So that also will uh, inhibit, uh, reduce the potency of the tablet. So these are all the things very important we need to ask the history. And mal digestion related to hypochloriduria. Many patients may be taking proton pump inhibitors, ranitidine, etc. by over the counter. Again, this also influences the absorption of the tablets. And many patients may be having the atrotic gastritis or the uh, H. pylori infection. This also inhibits the absorption of the thyroxine tablets. Next is very important is GI condition that causes poor pH control. There are various GI conditions like uh, uh, gastroparesis, helicobacter pylori infection, inflammatory bowel disease leading to poor TSH control. But the two most important history we have to ask is to rule out celiac disease and lactose intolerance. So lactose intolerance, avoid the lactose containing food. But as hypothyroidism is an autoimmune disease, many patients may be having associated celiac disease also. In North India, the patient will have typical symptoms because they used to take a lot of wheat. But in South Indian patients, they don't take wheat regularly. So the symptoms will not be uh, clear cut. So we have to ask for uh, clearly whether while taking the wheat items or oats, whether they are having GA symptoms or we can go for the testing also, IgA level and IgA, IgA uh, TTG level. If that is positive, by just avoiding gluten uh, diet, the TSH will come under good control. Drugs that interfere with the LT4, I will discuss in the next slide. And again, if the patient is diagnosed as hypothyroidism, still uh, after increasing the dose, the patient is losing weight and TSH is not coming under control and patient is pale, having diarrhea, etc. Always rule out adrenal insufficiency because again, hypothyroidism can be associated with adrenal insufficiency. If adrenal insufficiency is not, uh, not treated properly, the TSH may not come under control. So pregnancy already, there will be re increased requirement of uh, thyroxine therapy uh, up to 25 to 30 percentage. And another important practical point, many patients now, PCOD patients or postmenopausal patients may be given estrogen therapy in the form of oral contraceptive pills, etc. Estrogen increases the thyroid binding globulin. So the free T4 level goes down uh, due to increase in the total T4. So TSH also increases. Again, it's very important. They also require increase in the dosage requirement. Obesity, it's like a chicken or egg. Overweight itself can lead to increase in the TSH. By reducing the weight itself, TSH can come down. So as I told, the dose is dependent on the body weight. So with increase in the OBC, there also will be increase in the body weight. Coming to proteinuria, uh, thyroxine is also binded albumin. 10% of T4 is bind, bounded to albumin. So increase in the albuminuria again lead to increase in the, the thyroxine excretion also. Again, this patient will require increase in the uh, thyroxine dose. Another important, biotin. So many of our patients now are taking biotin uh, in the form of multivitamins or biotin supplements for air fall, etc. Biotin, again, interferes with many assays. One is 33 T4 TSH, vitamin B12. Nowadays, you may be seeing many patients coming with high very uh, B12 levels in mass cell checkup. They may be a pure vegetarian, but B12 may be very high. That may be due to the biotin interference. And troponin, very important for the uh, uh, people who are treating ICU. Again, biotin can interfere with the... Uh, troponin levels also. Other testings like uh, T, uh, PTH also can be interfered with biotin. But good thing is biotin is a water-soluble substance. So if you stop biotin for 24 hours and do the testing, that interference can be prevented. Macro TSH interference is again, it's like a macroplactinemia. The TSH binded with the, uh, TSH binding immunoglobulin will not be excreted by the kidney. So it will be there in the uh, body and always it gives an ITSH level. So when it should be suspected, if patient doesn't have any hypothyroid symptoms and T3, T4 levels are within normal or in the higher normal range, but still TSH is elevated, we need to th think about macro TSH interference. And last not but, but not the least, aerotrope hyperplasia, very, very important for the neurosurgeons. Many times the patient complains of headache in untreated hypothyroidism or severe hypothyroidism. Many times they will have this uh, thyrotrop hyperplasia mimicking uh, pituitary adenoma. So this may be one of the reasons where there is a gra very gradual decrease in the TSH. So this doesn't require surgery. By giving just a proper thyroxine dose, usually the thyrotrop hyperplasia comes down. So many times you do see this kind of uh, patients in uh, childhood, juvenile hypothyroid. So treatment is just to increase the dose of uh, thyroxine according to the body weight. Usually the TSH comes down. And what are the drugs that interfere with the T4? So drugs that increases the catabolism of T4 are commonly used drugs like rifampicin, carbamazepin, etc. Again, the people may increase in the dosage. And drugs which interfere with absorption are iron, calcium, and most of the anti-gastric drugs like sucralfate, PPI, etc. also interfere with the absorption. All these things should be kept in mind while you are treating difficult to treat hypothyroid case. As I told, mostly 95% it's very easy to treat, but in 5% of the patient will not be knowing what is the cause. Very basic thing is take proper history, spend some time because after multiple questioning, only the patient will tell 
I am missing one or two days of uh, therapy every week, or I am taking immediately coffee or tea immediately after taking tablets. All those things will come after we have finished our prescription and uh, we will have given the prescription. Then they will tell us. So whether that will affect the thyroid uh, values. So always take the history properly. Most of the time that will solve the problem. And also at the back of the mind, think about the lab analytical errors like micro TSH or biotin influencing the uh, TFTs, etc. And mole absorption very important. Uh, many many times in our practice we do see uh, we will be keeping on increasing the thyroxine dose, but TSH may not be coming down. And many times we have di diagnosed celiac disease purely based on this uncontrolled TSH, even after increasing the dose, many cases of celiac disease has been uh, diagnosed by giving just gluten-free diet, many times the TSH will come down. So we'll go to the subclinical hypothyroidism. So I'll take three cases uh, just to make you familiar. familiar. So first case is 18-year-old female, has mild symptoms, has mild goiter, a TSH elevation is 4.6 only, but if you antibody negative, Basically, she's saying female with mild symptoms and mild goitral and mild TSH elevation. The second case is 40-year-old male, middle-aged fellow, and moderate symptoms, and TSH elevation is moderate, 9.8. Antibody is positive, and he's saying middle age. Third is 86-year-old male, symptoms mild, and TSH elevation is 5.9. Antibody negative, but he's elderly. So on what basis we need to decide uh, which patients need treatment? So one thing is, on the persistence of subclinical hypothyroidism, repeat the TSH after one or, one or two months. And the treatment decision is purely based on the age. And if age is less than 65 years and 4.5 to 7, the treatment decision is based on the symptoms, antibody, progressively increasing thyrotropic level, and whether the patient is planning for pregnancy or the patient has goiter. If any of the is positive, then treat the patient. And more than 65, Till TSH of 7, don't worry, don't repeat the value, no need for evaluation. Please don't treat, treat this patient because more than 65 years, the patient is already prone for lone AF, atrial fibrillation, and also osteoporosis, so treatment is not recommended. More than 10, any age, without doubt, you can start the treatment, but start the dose, uh, low dose and gradually increase the dose. And 7 to 10, less than 65 years, irrespective of this parameters, that is symptoms, antibodies, or goiter, start the treatment in less than 65 years because data says that the TSH 7 to 10 in less than 65 years, there is increase in the stroke or coronary artery disease and mortality. So we can start the treatment. But more than 65, 7 to 10, consider this parameter, symptoms, antibody, uh, progressively increasing thyrotropin levels or goiter. If anything is positive, then we can consider treatment. It's not definitely treat. You can consider treatment based on the parameters. So the most important point is less than 7, more than 65 years, Please don't treat the patient. So let's come to the case. So this case is 18-year-old female, only mild symptoms, mild elevation in TSH, antibody negative. So this patient doesn't need treatment, only follow up because he has mild goiter. Second case, moderate symptoms, TSH more than 7, so definitely needs treatment. And antibody is also positive, we need treatment. Third case, age more than 65, TSH is less than 7, so no question of repeating or further evaluation. Just uh, don't treat. So tell them, just reassure the patient he doesn't need treatment. Next, coming to hyperthyroid. Hyperthyroid, again, uh, it's a very tricky, uh, tricky one because uh, we have to differentiate Graves' disease from the thyroiditis. So if the patient has goiter, active uh, Graves' disease, uh, things like orbitopathy, dermopathy, no need for further evaluation, no need to do TSH receptor antibody or thyroid scan, directly start the treatment. If patient doesn't have goiter or orbitopathy or dermopathy, then we have to make sure that you are not dealing with thyroiditis. So get then scintigraphy. If the scintigraphy is contraindicated like pregnant or a postpartum state, then get the TSH receptor antibody. If there is increased uptake, then it's graves. If it's suppressed, then thyroiditis. And again, if the patient has nodule, get the scintigraphy. That is a thyroid technician scan. If it suggests you have hot nodule, then it's a toxic adenoma. So what are the treatment modalities? One is medical. Uh, mainly the control of symptoms is with uh, uh, beta blocker and control of hyperthyroidism with the thionomates. So we have two drugs, uh, carbimethyl, methimethyl group, and second is propithyroidism. The positive thing is it's very safe. The side effects are very mild, but uh, the negative thing is only the remission rate is only 20 to 30 percentage. And usually many patients will trigger radioidine ablation because they will have recurrence. Radioidine ablation is indicated for Graves' disease, uh, particularly relapsed patient and toxic multinodular goiter. And in pregnancy patient, we have to avoid it. And after radiodine ablation for six months, they should not plan uh, pregnancy. 
and the negative thing is almost 80% of the patient will go for hypothyroid and surgery is indicated when there is a contraindication to the medical therapy and if the patient has large goiter then surgery is preferred so mainly anti thyroid drug is preferred when the patient is pregnancy or plan for pregnancy and patient has active graves ophthalmopathy again radioiodine therapy is contraindicated either the patient has to go for surgery or uh, anti thyroid drugs and if the patient has high likelihood of remission again this is very important point female gender mild disease small goiter negative or low titer antibody there is more likelihood of remission so better go for anti thyroid drug rather than radioiodine ablation or surgery when radioiodine ablation is uh, completely indicated if the patient has liver disease where anti thyroid drug cannot be given a major adverse reaction to anti thyroid drugs and the patient a very important again very important point already if patient has arrhythmia or atrial fibrillation or congestive heart failure please go for definitive therapy and don't give anti thyroid drugs and try to stop it because if the patient has recurrence again he can land up in arrhythmia so please go for radioiodine ablation so these are the absolute indication for radioiodine ablation again the dose is dependent on the uh, severity of the t4 if t4 is 2 uh, to 3 times more than the upper limit of normal start with the i dose 30 to 40 mg of methimazole if it is only 1.5 to 2 times you can start with 10 to 20 mg of methimazole so summary Which drug is preferred? Methimazole or carbimazole? Because PTU it has liver side effects only in first trimester of pregnancy. We use PTU. Otherwise, methimazole or carbimazole. For how long should the patient be treated? At least give the treatment for 12 to 18 months, even if the patient become euthyroid. Because anti-thyroid drugs have immunosuppressive effects, so you have to give for at least 12 to 18 months. Do higher dose bring the disease under more rapid control? Definitely yes, but the dose doesn't influence the chance of remission. So definitely you have to give for 12 to 18 months, irrespective of the starting dose. or the baseline predictors or the baseline predictor predictor for likelihood of remission definitely yes mild severity mild goiter and tfx receptor antibody low titer and female gender and elderly people usually predicts high likelihood of remission the pre treatment with atd decreases adverse outcomes after radioiodine ablation possibly yes so it's always better to bring the patient to euthyroid before subjecting for radioiodine therapy and methimazole is preferred over ptu because ptu decreases the success rate of radioiodine ablation Uh, so as i already discussed other cause of hyperthyroidism uh, in uh, very brief so this uh, scintigraphy shows no uptake so it is suggestive of thyroiditis again very important always uh, differentiate thyroiditis versus graves disease if the patient is not affordable for uh, uh, scintigraphy or tsh receptor again just ask for the history uh, the usually the thyroiditis follows upper respiratory tract infection and they will have pain and tenderness if pain and tenderness is there along with hyperthyroidism suspect thyroiditis If the patient is not affordable, just give beta blockers and uh, paracetamol for the pain, and just follow the patient after four to six weeks. Mostly, the patient will uh, have euthyroid after four to six weeks. If the patient is affordable, we can go for the uh, scintigraphy. Scintigraphy is suggestive of thyroiditis. Again, reassure: no need for any anti-thyroid drugs. Just give beta blocker and paracetamol. And if the patient has hot nodule, then treatment of choice is radioactive iodine therapy. No need for even uh, anti-thyroid drugs or any other surgery. If it's hot nodule, clear cut, directly go for the radioiodine ablation. and coming to subclinical hyperthyroidism in a single slide it's almost similar to subclinical hypothyroidism but ulta here also you have to consider the age along with the age consider the comorbidities whether the patient is at risk for cardiovascular disease risk for osteoporosis here if it's more than 65 years we need to treat in subclinical hypothyroidism less than 65 we treat more than 65 we don't treat in subclinical hyperthyroidism more than 65 we treat more than 65 if tsh is less than detectable range with the underlying cause either heart nodule or grave disease treat accordingly If 0.1 uh, detectable range, if the patient is risk for the cardiovascular osteoporosis, then treat. And if patient is less than 65, then either you can do observation, or if the patient is symptoms are having out normal, you can treat. So basically, the treatment is purely based on the age. More than 65, most of the patient will require treatment. Less than 65, you can just observe. Only if patient has symptom, which is very rare in subclinical hyperthyroidism, most of the patient will not require treatment. So subclinical hypo and hyper main uh, criteria is based on their age. Coming to the last part of my talk, another three or four minutes. Thyroid nodules. Again, thyroid nodules is very very common uh, clinical scenario. Almost ten uh, percent of the patient will have uh, thyroid nodule in their lifetime, and women are affected more. And only five to ten percent of the nodules are malignant. And usually uh, the thyroid nodules are slow growing. And even if it's a carcinoma, it will be very slow growing, and most of them are treatable. how we have to approach so if there is a suspicion of thyroid nodule get a tsh and thyroid ultrasound if tsh yeah. is subnormal then rule out thyroid uh, this one toxic nodule uh, thyroid uh, adenoma uh, toxic adenoma so do an uh, technetium scan 
if it's a functioning go for ablation if tsh is normal or elevated then we need to see for whether the phonographically it meets the fnac criteria if it meets the fnac criteria then we need to go for fnac what are the fnac criteria if it is solid hypo hypoechoic nodule irregular margin microcalcification taller than wide and evidence of extra thyroidal extension even if the size is more than 1 cm we have to go for fnac usually less than 1 cm no subcentrimetric uh, nodule no need for fnac more than 1 cm if this uh, uh, pictures are there we have to subject the patient for fnac intermediate suspicion is hypoechoic so no, solid nodule without this uh, criteria other uh, features again more than 1 cm uh, the fnac is indicated all others if it's more than 1.5 cm subject the patient for fnac again most important i'm not going into detail about the thyroids classification but while you are giving uh, request for ultrasound to the phonologist just mention the request a radiologist to mention the thyroid classification because this makes our life easier because it's very difficult for us to interpret if the patient brings to, to the uh, general physician or uh, uh, gynecologist uh, it's very difficult for them to say whether the patient requires fnac or not but if the radiologist give this thyroid classification if the thyroid classification is more than 3 three or more than three then chance of malignancy is more so definitely the patient requires fnac so always record for thyroid classification also when you are requesting for ultrasound fnac again in fnac also request the pathology to mention the betet sir because very common in our uh, setting that most of the pathology don't mention betet sir classification so betet sir classification again gives us idea whether the, there is a chance of malignancy so betet sir classification three or more then the, there is high chance of cancer risk so then we have to subject the patient for surgery If it is two, then more likely benign. So the mostly we can just follow up the patient. No need for any surgery. For therapy of thyroid nodules most most commonly it will be just to monitor. If there is a no evidence of malignant, just to monitor. Unless that uh, nodule is very big and have some local symptoms, the patient will require surgery. Or if, uh, as I told, thyroid three or more or better side three or more, the patient will require surgery. And don't start for therapy for thyroid nodule because it is not going to help the patient. If you are going to observe, then the duration of observation is basically depends on the ultrasonic findings and the uh, FNAC findings. So varies from six months to twenty-four uh, uh, months. So if it's uh, everything is benign, nothing like uh, looking like malignancy, we, you can monitor every days also. But there is a slight suspicion, then monitor every six months to one year. And if it's heart nodule, obviously you go for the radiation therapy. So hypothyroidism. it's very simple to treat in most of the cases but in refractory hypothyroidism that is if the patient is requiring more than 1.9 or 2 microgram per kilogram body weight first take proper history most of the times we can uh, solve the issue by taking proper history itself and giving proper education if still uh, that is not possible then rule out other causes whatever i told and hypothyroidism always important differentiate graves from others always uh, took proper history Uh, look for whether the pay ask whether patient is having pain or there is a tenderness. If it is there, most likely thyroid it is. You can just observe or get the technician scan. And treatment depends on the underlying etiology, whether it's a Graves' disease or heart nodule, and also natural history of the disease. As I told, the remission rate is very low in Graves' disease, and also other things we have to consider whether the patient is planning for pregnancy or pregnant or any liver disease, active Graves' ophthalmopathy. All those things we need to consider to decide whether the patient requires uh, tablets or iodine therapy or surgery. subclinical thyroid thyroid disease a treatment decision depends on the age for both hypo and hyper so hypothyroidism subclinical if less than 65 the patient will require treatment and if it's subclinical hyperthyroid more than 65 along with the comorbidities the patient will require treatment and thyroid nod nodules close monitoring is essential and always request for thyroids and better sa scoring while you are uh, requ giving request for the ultrasound or the fnac thank you thanks for patience listening any questions i'll be happy to answer ट्रीटमेंटर so there are a variety of this uh, other than recurrent thyroid is subacute thyroid disease and even the seasonal thyroid disease are there so many times even the mild viral illness also can present like uh, hyper the mild hyperthyroidism so in those cases usually the patient doesn't require treatment anti thyroid drugs you just give uh, beta blockers for symptomatic therapy 
and if pain is there any sedatives we can give and rarely very rarely we use steroid if the pain is significant and the patient is not tolerating the local pain or severe tenderness that give we, we give steroid probably one in two cases per year we give steroid for subacute thyroiditis subacute thyroiditis is a very common condition but we rarely give steroids so very rarely we give uh, uh, steroid therapy other things is drug induced like uh, if the patient is on uh, amiodarone those patients also can present with thyroiditis that also has to be ruled out sir Uh, I have a Sometimes question. Sometimes they take it in uh, pregnancy also. So pregnancy is completely pregnancy is completely different. So pregnancy, uh, please don't start anti-diarrhea drugs uh, unless you are very sure that the patient is having Graves. So the patient has goiter, ophthalmopathy, dermopathy. Then you can start treatment. Otherwise, mostly it's a physiological changes during uh, pregnancy or due to the hyperemesis gravidorum. Or rarely chorea carcinoma. Those things are very rare. So I'm not going to discuss about that. So don't start the treatment. If you have any doubt, please refer to the endocrinologist. And because recently, last week also, I saw one patient just for the mild changes in the thyroid function test. The patient has been started on very high dose of hyperthyroidism, and the patient has taken for almost two or the first trimester. So it's, it's still happening in our community. Even from any corporate hospital, I do see patient uh, coming, patient receiving anti-thyroid drug mistakenly. So if a pregnancy hyperthyroidism. please make two times or three times investigate the patient make sure the patient has graves disease then start the treatment sir uh, so there are other uh, questions salvam sir please go ahead sir uh, sir in a 50 50 55 year old male when we get the thyroid function test done um, some of the labs give the upper limit of tsh as 5.3 or 5.6 and recently i saw some of the standard labs giving the upper limit as 8.3 i'm really confused what is the sir so that's those depends on the lab what uh, reagents they are using but usually the uh, we uh, take this 4.5 as the cut off but as the age increases again we again as, as a clinician we should not see that one so if for example if the patient is 75 years or 8 years old uh, patient is coming even 7.5 i will consider as normal so i will know i will not worry if the tsh is 6 or 7 but if the young age then i will be more concerned that one so that's what i told age depends it depends on the age we need to decide so more than 4.5 it is classed as subclinical hypothyroidism but more than 6.5 up to 7 we can keep it as a normal and even if it's more than 80 years even 7.5 we can consider as normal no need to evaluate sir that's why i said the age again, same thing in obesity so again same thing in obesity even obese people can have tsh up to 6 as normal if you do all the work up antibody everything everything will be normal but they will have tsh of uh, around 6 And if just they reduce the body weight, the TSH will come down. With those patients also, it's uh, better not to start treatment because we, we, if we start treatment with uh, thyroxine therapy, they will think they will reduce the weight with thyroxine therapy. They will begin thus. I have been taking treatment, but I am not reducing the weight. We have to tell that that the uh, increase in TSH is due to your obesity, not due to the disease per se. So just monitoring and reducing weight itself will lead to reduce in the thyroid levels, TSH level. Patients on rifampicin, how do you space the drugs? because you are not supposed to take go up together but both are supposed to be taken in empty stomach yeah again as i told rifampicin also interferes with the thyroid absorption so yes. probably uh, you can give one hour gap uh, you can give that take thyroxine therapy first and after 30 40 minutes you can the patient can be asked to take the rifampicin sir after 40 minutes you can take 40 40 minutes yeah 40 40 minutes again if the uh, again again rifampicin is essential drug usually in endocrinology we don't interfere with other treatment Yeah, we usually adjust our our yeah, treatment. Ask this question specifically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all. So if the TSH is going high, we will increase the dose. Anything, diabetes or thyroid, any treatment, we don't interfere with other specialty treatment. We adjust our treatment part. So usually, if TSH goes high, we increase the dose because it's a very mild therapy without any major side effects. So you can give at least forty five minutes gap after taking the thyroxine therapy. What should be the gap after taking uh, rifampicin for food? So I'm not very sure. I think uh, pulmonary fissions must be there. I, at least I think 15 to 30 minutes should be given. Okay. Right. So there are other questions. Can I question. take? Yes, sir. May I, may I ask one question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, do we have to see a single TSH raise as a as a good enough uh, reason to diagnose a hypothyroidism, or do we repeat after some time? See, if the patient has symptoms. With over hypothyroidism, that is TSH more than ten, then we can start the treatment directly. If the patient has subclinical hypothyroidism, but there is no treatment, 
uh, no symptoms, then it's better to repeat the TSH because nowadays we are seeing a patient particularly coming with mouse cell checkups. Many times the TSH will be elevated. If you repeat the test in the other standard lab, the TSH will be normal. If the patient Precisely. doesn't have symptoms, subclinic hypothyroidism, we can repeat the test. And over type of that, some more than 10 with symptoms, you directly can start the treatment. Excellent. Thank you. Sir, uh, there are questions in the chat box. May I address the same? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, the question is, what, Dr. Shyamla has asked this. Uh, thyroid test, uh, do we have to do TSH, total T3, total T4, free T3, free T4, everything, or what, what do you suggest to do? That's what I, I showed in my slide. TSH is the primary test. If you want to do one test, TSH will do. And if you suspect hyperthyroidism, then obviously T4, even T3, T3, T3 suspect only T3 thyrotoxicosis. That is, TSH is suppressed and T4 is normal, you have to get T3. Otherwise, T4, TSH will do. No need to do all the tests. Usually in my clinical practice, I do only total T4, total T3 and if required and TSH, not free. Because free T3 and free T4, it depends on the lab quality. Uh, even standard labs, many times if we see the, the lab is, no, the reports are not satisfactory. Even in normal patient, if we see TSH will be, free T4 will be very low borderline. Uh, so because it requires equilibrium dialysis, which is not available everywhere. So it's not very standardized method, free T3, free T4, what reports we are getting. So usually in my clinical practice, I do total only. And if the patient is sick, and if you think there is a disturbance in the thyroid binding globulin or like, like say nephrotic syndrome or patient is on estrogen therapy, contraceptive pills, then doing free T4 makes sense. Otherwise, in your routine clinical practice, if you do total T4 and TSH will do. Thank you. And Dr. Manorama Ma'am has asked, what about the test for newborn uh, delivered by a thyroid patient? So again, it's a completely different topic. So you can do either cord blood TSH or after uh, 48 hours, 48 to 72 hours. Why we have to do after 72 hours is usually once the baby is taken away from the mother, there will be a, a sudden increase in TSH and it will take uh, 48 to 72 hours to settle down. So you can take either cord blood or after 72 hours. So remember the, the value 10, 20, 40, 80. Okay. If more than 80, definitely directly start the treatment. TSH more than 80, start the treatment. More than 40, take the venous sample again, start the treatment. If it's 20 to 40, repeat the test after one week. If it's 10, more than 10 to 20, more than 10, any time after uh, 10 days of uh, uh, this one, just a delivery, then you can start the treatment. So remember 10, 20, 40, 80. Most important thing is do the test. That's very important. You can always take an uh, opinion from the specialist after that. Thank you. So that's a very important point, uh, which we've been trying to advocate everywhere as well. Thank you so much, sir. If there are no more questions, I thank Dr. Shanmugh Sundar for this excellent presentation. And then we'll move on to our next uh, topic.